All right, the title of the sermon this morning is to read the Bible. Read the Bible. We just read through Psalm 119. Psalm, the book of Psalms is the longest book in the Bible, right? And the longest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119. And Psalm 119 is about the Word of God. So, you know, that gives you an idea of how, you know, how important God yeah, finds singing and His Word. Right, that the longest chapter and the longest book is about his word, but the longest book is a, is a book of Psalms. Right, it makes you wonder that like, when you read through Psalm 119, like what the song sounded like, and it was you know if it takes a while to to read, imagine how long it took to sing, unless they just sang it in the, the different letter parts. You know, it was one big chapter but all different parts to this song. So let me ask you this morning, as you reflect on the week that's gone by. You know, the title of the sermon is Read the Bible. Did you read the Bible this week? You can uh, ask yourself that question. And I mean, like, really read the Bible. You sat down and you read multiple passages. You know, you can't just have a verse on the wall and say you read the Bible every day. You know, that's, that's cheating a bit. But did you read the Bible this week? How much did you read the Bible? I mean, ask yourself this question as a Christian. Like, have you ever read through the whole Bible? Like, have you read every passage in the Bible? Have you read it through from cover to cover? Right? And if you, say, if you say to yourself, well, no, I haven't, ask yourself the question, how long have you been a Christian? And how long have you been saved for? And you still haven't read through all of God's Word. You know, that's a, that's, a, that's a shameful thing for Christians. You know, we, have, we, have, we live in the information age. It's so easy for us to get God's Word. People have died to get God's Word. People have died to translate God's Word. People have died to try and preserve God's Word. You know, a lot of scriptures being burnt. We have it in the palm of our hands, right? But a lot of Christians have not even read the whole Bible. And if you've been saved for several years, I mean, that's a very shameful thing, isn't it? You believe on God. You believe the word on, the, on the Lord Jesus Christ, yet you have not even read all of God's Word. So that's why I want to encourage you this morning, is, is to read your Bible. If you don't read the Bible, read it. Get to know it. Love it. You know, Psalm 119 we talked about was uh, is the longest chapter in the Bible. It's about God's Word. Right? So this whole psalm, you see, like, as you read through every verse, you see every verse is talking about God's word. Here are some, uh, some of my favorite ones. Psalm 119, verse 9. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. So this verse sort of makes me think about, you know, maturing as a young person. You get into a lot, sometimes you get into a lot of mischief when you're young. You know, you think you know better. You know, you're hanging around with the wrong people. You're doing things that you really shouldn't be doing. And the Bible says, well, wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way, live a more pure life, or by taking heed thereto according to thy words. If they follow God's word, then they'll, they'll remove some of the bad things that young people do in their life. And unfortunately, nowadays, people carry on with those bad things that people do, like fornication and drugs and all that sort of stuff, into, well into their 30s and 40s when they're not even young anymore. Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. This is the verse we chose for the theme verse, well, for the, for the verse for Kids Club, because we wanted to sort of focus on Bible memorization. That's what this verse is alluding to, saying it's like I, this, the, the God's word I have in my heart. So it's, I'm constantly reflecting on it, and it reminds me not to sin. Right? Psalm 119, verse 18, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. You see, you don't always have to get nuggets of truth from sermons. You know, everyone's always trying to find these nuggets of truth, you know, scouring YouTube and scouring the internet, trying to find these nuggets of truth. Well, why don't you just pray to God and say, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And when you read the Bible, you may come across an awesome nugget of truth that the Holy Spirit reveals to you directly. Right? Psalm 119, verse 18. Psalm 119, verse 24. Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. You see how when you know God's word, it can guide you in life, it can help you make decisions. Right? If you delight 
in them. Psalm 119, verse 27. Make me to understand the way of thy precepts. So shall I talk of thy wondrous works. You see, a lot, of the re a lot of the times, the reason why people are not bold about speaking the things of God, they're not bold about sharing their faith, they're not bold when they have an opportunity to talk about the things of God, it's because they don't understand the things of God. Right? You don't understand the things of God. I mean, you don't spend enough time studying the Word of God. You don't spend enough time reading the Word of God. You don't know it well enough so that when there's an opportunity to talk of God's wondrous works, you don't. Right? But he's saying, hey, if you understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. Psalm 19 verse 30 is, Incline my heart unto thy testimonies and not to covetousness. So you can see there, like we talked about, you know, you know, we talked about James, you know, loving the world, loving God, friend of the world, friend of God, the lusts of the world, the lusts of the flesh. You know, he's saying, hey, if you incline your heart unto God's word, you'll be less inclined, right? You know, to be inclined to covetousness. You can see the, 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 the dichotomy there, right? The two um, on either side. Psalm 119, verse 46. I will speak of thy testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed right so the more you know god's word the more you speak you won't be ashamed of being a christian right standing boldly psalm 118 verse 71 look at this it is good for me that i have been afflicted there's two verses i saw like as, as joshua was reading through it that is just talking about affliction it is good for me look at this that i have been afflicted that i might learn thy statutes see some everyone always wonders why does god like allow me to go through all these hard things and these trials and everything hey maybe he's trying to get you to learn his word because if you don't go through some tough times hey, the bible sits on the shelf doesn't it collects dust the app hasn't been opened for a while right bible app but when you get afflicted and you suffer a bit makes you think about God. You think, man, I'm going to get back to learning the Bible, reading the Bible. Psalm 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. See, this is the attitude we should have with God's word. It's more valuable for us, to us, than even the riches of this world can offer. Psalm 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Right? This is the eternality of God's word. God's word is eternal. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Psalm 119, verse 92. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine afflictions. You see how knowing God's word and having God's word in your heart, it can encourage you. Right? So when you go through hard times, it helps you to overcome these afflictions right he's saying here unless i knew god's word i may not have been able to encourage myself in the lord right psalm 119 look at this oh how love i thy law it is my meditation all the day so meditation is not like uh people who do yoga these days and you know meditation to them is like clearing your mind and not thinking about anything which is actually a very dangerous thing to do, right? You clear your mind, clear yourself of everything, I mean, you need, then something is empty to enter in, right? So when the Bible says meditation, meditation is when you think on things, right? So when you're meditating on God's word, you're thinking on God's word and saying, hey, he loves, this is David here saying, I love God's word so much, I'm thinking about it all the time. Hey, how do you think about something you don't know? How do you know something if you don't read it, right? So you gotta read it. To know it so you can think about it psalm 119 verse 98 thou through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies for they are ever with me and you know god's law helps you to make wise decisions so he's wiser than his enemies right it's not that he knows there's a different difference between wisdom and knowledge right knowledge is just getting more information but wise being wiser is how then you make decisions about the information you know yeah, and that can often be the, the, the difference between victory and defeat. Yeah. And see how there? For they are ever with me. What does that mean? That means he had God's word in his heart. Right? So he didn't need it. You know, he didn't need to like, you know, he's on the battlefield and like, oh, I ain't got such a... Yeah, he had it in his heart. Right? For they are ever with me. Psalm 119 verse 9, I have more understanding than all my teachers. For thy testimonies are my meditation. You see there, because teachers are getting information from the same source, right? Anything I'm teaching, I'm getting it from the same source, right? So if you understand the Bible 
you can understand more than even your teachers. Psalm 119 verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Right? So just going back to that wisdom, helping you to make decisions. You know, and sometimes what I like about this verse is, you know, it's a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. So sometimes God's word won't, won't tell you, it doesn't necessarily tell you the future. You don't know maybe what's going to happen in a year's time, five years' time, ten years from time. time. But what God's word tells you, it, it, it will help you to make the next decision, right? the next step. It's a light unto your feet, a lamp unto your feet, and a light unto my path. Right? So it helps you to walk. That's why the way I always think of the Christian life is like, you know, we just keep walking. We just keep walking in God, but then God directs our path. We don't really know where the path leads in the future, but we just know that there's enough light to keep taking the next step. All right. Psalm 119, verse 28. Therefore, oh, I must have, I must have not copied that one properly. I'll skip that one. Psalm 119, verse 140. Thy word is very pure, therefore thy servant loveth it. Psalm 119, verse 160. Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. All right, so from beginning to end. And last one, Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So, you know, there's, there's many different aspects to this one where, you know, we have peace from God's law. I mean, one is, you know, I mean, you have peace through, I mean, salvation, right? By having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, that's one way to have peace. But, you know, another way to have peace is, you know, being able to encourage yourself, like, like David talked about before, like he overcomes affliction. You can have peace knowing that there's a way to escape trials and tribulations and temptations and things like that. But other ways you can have peace when you know God's law is that you know eventually it's, you know, Jesus wins. You know, one day you have a home in heaven. So there's many different factors that give you this peace that passes understanding. And it says nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall you know, cause them to fail if you love God's law. Um, you know, oftentimes people sort of use this you know, verse to say, you know, nothing will upset you. But I think that you know, makes sense as well. <laughs> you know, like if you have a good understanding of God's law and you love God's law, you know, no, no, nothing people say really upset you. You know, sometimes when you're having a spiritual conversation with somebody and they don't really know what they believe, they get defensive. You know, they get upset because they, they don't like being challenged. Right? If you love God's law, you don't mind being challenged. Nothing offends you. Nothing anyone's going to say is going to upset you because you know you've got the truth. You know, when, you, when you don't know you have the truth, then you're a little shaky. You're a little doubtful. Right? But you've got to love God's law. So you have God's word in your heart. You have God's word with you. You have that sort of stability. Right? So this is the longest chapter in the Bible. The longest psalm is about God's word. That will give you an idea how important God's word is to him. The question is, how important is God's word to you? Number two. Now, it's not only the word of God, right? The word of God is God as well. So sometimes people, you know, they differentiate between these. And they say, you've got God, and then you've got God's word. But you've got to remember, God's word is God too, right? So these are equal. When you think of God's word, that is God too. Now, we don't know exactly all the mechanics of how that works, but that's why we treat God's word with the same reverence that we treat God, because they're one and the same. John 1.1, 1, 1, look at this. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay, so what, what is the practical, practical application of this truth? Well, think about this. If God's word is God, can you know God without knowing God's word? You say, I know God, I want to know God. But do you want to know his word? You know, some people want to know God, they just, they're just after a feeling. They're after like the Mormon burning in the bosom. Do you know what I mean? They're after some experience. They're like, I just want to know God. Well, if you want to know God, then know his word, because his word is God, right? You say, I love God, but do you love his word? You can't love God if you don't love his word. You say, like, oh, I love God so much, right? But you never read his word. 
then you don't love God. Because right? if you loved God, you'd love reading his word because the word is God. Right? So this is, this is why I'm trying to share this point here. The word is just not God's word only. It is God. So anything you think about God, do you think about his word? Right? So the Bible is the foundation of everything we believe and practice. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. You know, it's a blessed thing to be able to grow up learning the Bible, knowing the Bible, just like Timothy did here. Like, you know, from a child he knew um, the Holy Scriptures and he knew these things. So, you know, you need to teach your children the Word of God. You know, I don't think they're too young to understand things. They pick things up. And, uh, you know, even the repetition, you know, they, they pick up, you know, good habits, right? 16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Uh, I went through this verse with the kids this morning, Kids Club, um, saying all scripture, which is the Bible, right? It's given by inspiration of God. So we think of inspiration like I was inspired by somebody else. They just give you an idea and things like that. Inspiration in the Bible is talking about a breath, right? So it's, it's basically saying here it's given by God speaking it. You know, like God spake all these words. That's what it means by given by inspiration of God. It's not just God inspiring people to write down their ideas, right? It's actually holy men of God, the Bible says, spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And is profitable, <laughs> is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So I learned a great way to sort of memorize this verse from a man called Jim Berg. But uh, he, he, always, he always taught this verse in this way. He said, doctrine is what is right, reproof is what is wrong, correction is how to make it right, and instruction in righteousness is how to keep it right. You see, so the Word of God, it teaches you what's right, what's wrong, how to make it right, and how to keep it right. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All right, so the Bible is not just the Word of God. You want to have that thought? No, it is God. So therefore, you can see what sort of relationship and how you feel and how you think about God by how you relate to his word, right? Do you, do you love God? Then you'll love his word. You know, do you know God? Then you'll know his word. If you don't know his word, you don't know God, right? So you can't really say, if you don't love his word, you don't love God, right? You can't, you can't say one or the other. You know, you can't say I love God, but I don't love his word because he's one and the same. All right, number three. Now, the Bible is needed for spiritual growth. It's needed for spiritual growth. Now, you ask yourself, am I growing in the faith? Well, are you growing in your knowledge of God's Word? You say, like, no, well, I'm not. I haven't read the Bible in weeks. I haven't read the Bible in months. Well, then you're not growing, right? Because if you want to grow spiritually, you've got to grow in God's Word. And the thing with spiritual growth is it can go backwards, you know, unfortunately in life, I don't know, fortunately or unfortunately, in life, no matter what you do, you constantly get older. Right? But in the spiritual life, that's not the case. In the spiritual life, if you stop growing, you can actually start going back to being a babe. And think about it. That's like, it's like thing, things that you might have known before and now you've forgotten. You know, maybe you knew God's word better at one stage and now you've forgotten a lot of it. Right? That's you regressing back in spiritual age. Right? Back to a baby. First Peter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You see, we need to grow with God's word. That's our spiritual sustenance. So, right, so one way you think about, am I growing? Right? You can grow in different ways. Right? You can grow in the knowledge of God's word, but you also grow in works as well. You can grow in charity, right? You can grow in purity, right? There's different ways you can grow, but one way you need to grow is by eating, and this is the Word of God. Luke 4, 3, this is the temptation of Jesus by Satan in the wilderness. 
And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Hebrews 5.12 For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So he's here, he's rebuking the Hebrews here, where he's saying, look, you, you are meant, you've been in the faith long enough that you're meant to be teaching others now. But unfortunately, you don't. You've come back to, to being a baby and, and needing milk again, and not somebody that's eating strong meat. Right, you see how the word of God is likened to food? And you know, food, you know, you don't eat food once a week. You know, people, they go to church once a week, and that's the only time they hear the Bible. And that's not how it's meant to be in your spiritual life. Right? You don't eat once a week. Right? You're not meant to read the Bible just once a week. Right? It's meant to be a daily thing. I mean, most of us will eat three meals a day. You know, some people believe you should eat five meals a day, smaller meals, you know, whatever. But it's a daily sustenance, isn't it? Verse 13, for everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So you see how, how well you know the Bible and how well you can utilize the Bible is also an indication of your spiritual growth. Right? So you know, sometimes people, you know, you, sometimes you'll talk to people and they say, oh, I know the Bible says this, I don't really know where it says, it says something. You know, well, that's your unskillful in the word of righteousness. Right? For he's a babe. So it shows that if you, if you don't know where things are in the Bible and, you know, to talk about things and things like that, then, you know, you're, you, you may still be a babe in Christ. Right? So if you haven't grown in Bible knowledge, then you probably haven't grown much as a believer either. Right? And then the next level after that is you want to strive to actually do what you learn. Verse 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So one thing you're growing by consuming the Word of God, right? And how much you know. But you know, when you're a full age, you know, when you're a mature Christian, you're using the Word of God. Right? You've got to use that energy that you consume. It's no different, like in real life. If you just consume a bunch of protein and carbs and you don't do any work, you just be an obese person. It's the same in the Bible. Right? You can know a lot, but that doesn't mean you're effective, that you're a strong Christian, right? Because you've got to use that knowledge. You've got to do some work with it. All right, number four. What else does reading the Bible do? It keeps you from false doctrine. It keeps you from false doctrine. You know, sometimes uh, new believers will wonder, like, oh, you know, where can I listen to some good preaching? Where can I get some good, like, Bible teaching? And my, my uh, recommendation to them is, look, you know, don't focus too much on just, you know, getting the content sound bites on YouTube and finding the you know, good preachers out there. You know, what you should be focusing on is reading the Bible. You just read through it and get familiar with it. So that way, when you do listen to that sermon online, when you do listen to that thing, you can discern whether what they're telling you is right or wrong. Because otherwise, you just listen to a bunch of stuff online and you don't actually end up knowing the Bible. You just know what that person believes. Yeah. It's the same in this church. You know, if, if all you know is what Victor preaches, you just know what I believe. But do you know what the Bible says? You know, you just know all my opinions, right? All my opinions on what the Bible says. But you need to know what the Bible says. That's what you need to know. So it keeps you from picking up things that are false because then you know what the Bible says and you'll know whether somebody's taken a verse out of context. Or you say like, I don't, you know, you'll be listening to Jordan Peterson, right? Everyone listens to Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson, like, is talking like an expert about the Bible. And then if you know the Bible, you're like, what the hell is this guy talking about? He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know these stories. It's just, it's just these, these professors these days, they just use the Bible like like lessons that they want to teach about it and then they just take the story completely out of its context about why God had it in there, what it was actually trying to teach. So you need to be careful. You know, I know a lot of people like Jordan Peterson. You know, he's got a lot of like good stuff about maybe, you know, being a man and all this woke stuff. And some of the stuff I've heard him say about the Bible is completely off. So just, uh, you know, but if you don't know the Bible, you know, you listen, you get on the Jordan Peterson bandwagon, you know, the shorts coming up, all the Jordan Peterson clips, you know, it's like, who's on the shorts clip now? You know, when you're scrolling through YouTube, right? You know, you're not going to know what's, what's right or wrong. Matthew 19, verse 1. 
And it came to pass that when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee and came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? What are they saying? Like, can you just divorce your wife for any reason? You know, maybe this guy's living in 2022, you know, where it's like, you know, can I just, you know, uh, what, do, what do they call it now? It's when you just, uh, irreconcilable differences. You know, that's it's like anything. <laughs> it's in marriage. Irreconcilable differences. It just means you don't want to be together anymore. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Right? So you see how Jesus says, Have ye not read? See, if they knew what the Bible said, they wouldn't have this idea that you can just divorce your wife for any reason. Luke 6, verse 1, And it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the cornfields and his disciples plucked the ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. And certain of the Pharisees said unto them, Why do ye that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Sabbath days. Right? So he said they're walk, walking through a cornfield, they're hungry, so they took some corn off the cornfield and rubbed and they ate it, right? Jesus answering them said, Have ye not read so much as this, what David did when himself was not hungered, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did, did take and eat the showbread, and gave also to them that were with him, which, is, which, which it is not lawful to eat, but for the priests alone. And he said unto them that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So he's saying, saying here, you didn't read. So, so what's the issue here, right? So Pharisees are trying to say, well, you're not meant to do any work on the Sabbath, right? And he's saying to them, didn't you read about David? So what David? David was traveling with his men, and I believe the priest's name was Abiathar. Abiathar. So David and his men are hungry. Now, there's all the food that's part of, like, you know, the, the, the priests and the Levites and all the stuff that they do. And only the priests and the Levites are meant to eat that stuff, right? But David comes with his men. You know, David's not a Levite. Remember, David's of the tribe of Judah. But they're starving. So he doesn't have any food, but he says, the only food that I've got is the showbread. So he gave him the showbread to eat. And, and Jesus saying, well, you know, it's not lawful for non-priests and non-Levites to eat this, but why was it okay for Abiathar to give David to eat? Because there's a greater law, which is to love people, right? And, and if they're hungry, you don't send them away hungry. So it's, it's not that the, the rituals that God had were more important than loving your neighbor as yourself, right? So it's like here, they're hungry. It's okay for them to eat. They're not breaking the Sabbath. So he's trying to tell them here, like, didn't you read that there are laws that sort of supersede others? Does that make sense? They need to be done in the context. So it's like all these rituals and things like that. They're done in the context of love too, that you don't just do them uh, uh, unmercifully. Right? So that's what he's saying here. But why, why did they have a problem? We're well, saying, hey, didn't you read about these things? So you see how like knowing God's word may change your mind about concepts that you may be misunderstanding, right? Because you may have a position in your mind, but then you think of a verse and you say, wait a second, like how does that position line up with that thing, right? So that's what they should have been doing. So how does that position of like telling people off for eating when they're hungry and plucking ears of corn as they walk through the field line up with David eating the showbread, right? So they say, oh, it's because there's some mercy there, right? Mark 12, then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. And they asked him, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if a man's brother die and leave his wife behind him and leave no children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were seven brethren, and the first took a wife, and dying left no seed, and the second took her and died, neither left he any seed, and the third likewise. And the seven had her and left no seed. Last of all, the woman died also. In the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. So the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're trying to come up with this situation to show, oh, it would be silly if resurrections happen, because whose wife shall she be if she's married seven people? Jesus answering said unto them, Do ye not therefore err, because ye know not the Scriptures? See, neither the power of God. For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. But as touching the dead, that they rise. Have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. 
He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. He therefore do greatly. Uh, so why is he bringing this up? Because remember, they, they were not believing in the resurrection. Right? So he's saying, well, because you don't believe in the resurrection, you think you're coming up with all these silly examples, right? Because you don't understand the resurrection. So then he corrects them by saying, remember how God in the Old Testament said, I'm the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob? Like, if these people are dead, he's saying God's not the God of dead people. That's why the resurrection is a resurrection, because he's the God of the living, right? And if he's the God of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, they're going to be alive, right? They're going to be resurrected. That's what he's going on there. So the resurrection is really important, but I'll skip over this for sake of time. But 1 Corinthians 15, I just wanted to show that the resurrection is a super important doctrine, but uh, that's probably a bit of a rabbit trail. Um, because my, my point here is that reading the Bible keeps you from false doctrine. See, we want to have an attitude of the um, Bereans, right? Where the Bereans were, were praised above those in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians, right? What does he say here? These were more noble, right? The people that were in Berea. This is why the Acts 17.11, um, I think a few ministries will use this, this sort of Berean mentality, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures. See this word here? See this word here? Search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. See, and this is the attitude every Christian should have, this Berean attitude that when you hear something about the Bible, right, you receive it and you say, okay, that sounds good, but you search the scriptures daily, whether those things were so, right? So you've got to search, we've got to know the Bible, you've got to make sure that whatever you're learning is right, right? So uh, who are you following? See, when we talk about when people, new believers, they just end up learning a lot of opinions of people, right? If, all you know is what somebody has taught you, then my question to you is, like, who are you following? Are you following God or man? Right? So you want to make sure you're following God, not man. Right? Can you support what you believe from the Bible? You know, you shouldn't be saying, you know, this is what I believe because this is, what Vic this is how Victor teaches it. This is what my church believes. You know, these are wrong answers. Right? You say, I believe this because the Bible says this. Because the Bible says this here. And then the next level to that is, this is how you correctly understand this other verse that you're trying to use as an objection right? to line up with the sound doctrine. Right? So it's not only knowing what you believe from the Bible, but defending what you believe. And defending what you believe means you can explain verses that may be used against your, your position, right? And understand those as well, right? So you don't want to just get to the point where you have a verse to substantiate what you believe. You want to also know the rest of the Bible so that you know your position is sound and in harmony with all the Bible, right? So number five. Number five, you know, Taking God's word for granted. You don't want to take God's word for granted. See, do you realize what you have access to in God's word? 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. So I'll just stop there first, because you know, remember this verse, verse 9. A lot of people use this verse to think about, oh, just the things that, the amazing things that we will get in heaven that we, we just don't know, like the things that God has prepared for us, right? which I believe is true as well, but in the context of this passage, it's talking about the, the wisdom of God, right? the knowledge of God. But he's saying, look, it's written that people don't know these things, right? And he's saying even the world didn't know, otherwise they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. I remember the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, 
So you see how like these things all tie together, that God is a spirit. He's revealed them unto us by his spirit. But the spirit, you know, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. You see, so, you know, this is why the, the things that were unknown are, are not necessarily, you know, I'm sure there are many things that are still unknown. But the things he's talking about here is he's saying, hey, they didn't know these things, but now we do. Right? We know them because God has revealed them in his word. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? So he's saying, how do you know what a man believes? Because it's the words of a man, the spirit of a man. Right? So how do you know what God thinks? It's the spirit of God. Where's the spirit of God? It's the word of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world. So you see, there's a spirit of the world too. So what's that? That's not just like a bad feeling. That's the bad doctrine and bad teaching, bad influence in the world, right? That comes to you, right? That must be cleansed by the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, verse 12, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words. Ah, you see there? The words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. So what are the words that the Holy Ghost teacheth? It's the Holy Bible, right? It's the Word of God. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So it's saying here that the flesh doesn't receive the Word of God, that's why it needs to be received by the Spirit. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So you see how the Bible is the mind of Christ. You know, like, a, you know, like a online these days, there's all like these master classes. You know, like the master class, you know, this person that's like, you know, very expert in anything, and that's, this is their master class, right? Well, that's what the Bible is. Right, the Bible is Jesus' masterclass. You want to know like everything about living spiritual? Remember, what's right, what's wrong, how to make it right, how to keep it right? That's Jesus' masterclass. Right? So if you understand what you have here and you read it, you can get the wisdom of God. You can have the mind of Christ. You can have that wisdom that was here in ages past through reading God's word. Ephesians 3.1, look at this, what Paul says here. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in a few times, in a few, a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. See, Paul the same. You know, Paul had many revelations from God. But you know, you can know those revelations. Why? Because you can read God's Word. Those revelations are revealed to us in God's Word. Right? So realize what you have. And the, and the last verse I'll go to is here in 2 Peter 1.16. I always like talking about this verse because you know, this verse shows that having God's Word is even better than some supernatural experience. 2 Peter 1.16, look at what it says here. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. This is Peter saying here. You know, we, we haven't followed just man-made wisdom. We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So Peter here is saying, hey, we're not just teaching you stories that were devised by man's tales and fables. He says, we saw it with our own eyes. That's what we're teaching you here. For he received from God the Father honour and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Right? So they would have heard that when he got baptised, remember? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. But they heard it a second time. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. So that's the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus was transfigured before them, and he says, we saw them. Remember Peter said, oh, because you know, he was there with Moses and Elijah, and he said, well, I must be thrilled three altars here. You know? So it's like such a, it would have been a really supernatural experience. But look at what he says here in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. See, a lot of, sometimes in the Pentecostal circles, 
You have a lot of people, they, they put too much emphasis on their emotions, what they feel. You know, this is very subjective. You know, it's, not, it's not a good thing to do. You know, our emotions should be, should be in check based on what we know about the Word of God. So that's an emotion. What about something you, like you see? What about an experience where you see something with your own eyes? Right, like Peter did here. They saw it with their own eyes when they were with them in the Holy Mount. Isn't that pretty sure? Well, well, Peter says here in verse 19, he has something even more sure than that. And what's that? We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. So there's that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. All right? So the Bible's telling us here that, hey, the Bible is the most sure thing. Even more sure than what you see with your own eyes. Even more sure than what you feel. Right? The Bible is what should be the foundation of what you see and what you, or, you know, and what you, what else you hear and what you feel. Okay, so in conclusion, read the Bible through. You know, have you read the Bible this week? Do you read the Bible? You know, make sure you read the Bible through. So I always recommend, you know, the way you should read the Bible is just, just read it from cover to cover, you know, but, you know, sometimes it's a bit easier to start in the New Testament. So you just start in the New Testament, you read through the New Testament, and you read through the Old Testament. But, but even if you don't understand it, just keep reading. You know, don't let that discourage you. Like, if you're reading through the Old Testament, passages get long and passages get a bit hard. You just keep reading, you know, and then you'll come back to it again. But the reason why, you know, you know I was taught just to read through it from cover to cover, and I was, you know, I recommend as well that you just read through it from beginning to end and just keep going around, is because that way you read through the Bible evenly. Do you know, because if you pick and choose... What ultimately ends up happening is you just kind of cherry pick the books that you like, the verses that you like. And then you don't read the books that you may not be so familiar with. Right? So it's good that you just read through it, so that you read through it all, right? And you read through it all at an even pace, right? And obviously you've got your study on top of that where you may be looking at certain passages. But we're talking about here just your general knowledge of just reading through the Bible. Right? So there's there's difference between studying the Bible and reading the Bible. Right? You want to read through the Bible and study is when you might be jumping at different passages and looking at specific words and things like that. But you don't want that only to be your Bible reading. Because sometimes people only study the Bible and they only know specific passages. So you want to read the Bible too so you get familiar with the whole Bible. Okay? So, hey, let's not be hearers of the word, let's be doers only. You know, you learned a sermon today about reading the Bible. Hey, make sure you start. Make sure you're reading it every day. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for teaching us through your word. And uh, Lord, help us to value your word. Help us not to take it for granted. And I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to be disciplined in our Bible reading so that we will grow. And that we'll be more bold witnesses for you and we will not be ashamed before you. So, Lord, uh, may this sermon encourage us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.